Okay, now, Geraldine, what would you like to uh, add for us to understand? Keep in mind this this uh, session. Okay. Where are we? It's it's my aunt's yurt site, and she was my mother's older sister. And they, she and her husband had no children. And my brother and I were like her kids. She was, she loved us and we loved her. And she was, taught me many things. And we liked to shop, she liked to shop and she was very good at uh, handwork. She taught to crochet and, and, and embroider. And she just loved us to pieces. So her year at sight is this, week and I would like to dedicate our study to her memory. Her name is Sora Bat Arya Vishindel. Amen. May her memory be always a blessing and uh, let's uh, begin studying um, in her honor. Thank you. So we are going to be looking at the Haftorah for Mishpatim. That's the Torah reading for this coming Shabbat. So if you have an Eitz Chaim Chumash, then the Haftorah begins on page 482, 482. It's not in my, no, 456. The Haftorah for Mishpatim. Oh, I'm sorry, the Haftorah. Yeah. I was looking at the Torah reading. Sorry. Right, we're, gonna, we're gonna get to the Torah reading in a second, but that's not what we're gonna really look at is the right. Haftorah. That's on 482. It's taken from the prophet Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah. Chapter 34, starting with verse 8. So if you're not using the Chaim, it's Jeremiah, chapter 34, uh, verse 8. So now just backing up, this was chosen, and we'll actually see um, that, that the, uh, the rabbinic decision about how to use this Haftorah, they're actually going to add at the end of the Haftorah, they're going to go backwards and take uh, a couple of verses from chapter 33. So it's not so uh, usual for that to happen, but uh, they're, they're going to do that as well. So, but mo mostly it's from um, a section, substantial section, starting from verse eight from chapter 34 in Jeremiah. So now backwards to the Torah reading. The Torah reading Mishpatim means fair judgments. And uh, last Shabbat, we stood at Mount Sinai. We heard the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments come from God, and they tell us, do this, don't do that. Now what we have is that God hands over to us the responsibility to deal with our own selves and with our own neighbors, with other human beings, and we have to make judgments. We have to put together rules for a, a society. How's the society going to function? So um, the Torah reading begins with extensive rules having to do with the category of the Hebrew slave and also the non-Hebrew slave. I wrote a little bit about that in this week's Torah portion, in this week's Torah Sparks. And then it goes on to a whole bunch of, uh, of rules and regulations. The traditional counting of mitzvot, where we say that there are 613 commandments in the Torah, um, this Torah portion, has a, uh, something like 50 mitzvot, more mitzvot than we've ever had in all the other Torah portions combined until today. So this is where the Torah takes a really sharp turn and starts going into law, 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 as opposed to stories. So um, the laws have to do mostly, in fact, I think totally, with civil law. So it has to do with damages. What if I hurt you? What if somebody hurts me? What if somebody steals from me? What if, uh, um, but also keeping a promise. What if I borrow something and it gets damaged? Am I responsible while I'm, while I'm borrowing the object that belongs to you? Um, if, it, if it gets damaged, do I have to pay you back while it was, you know, uh, you know damaged in, in, in my, pro, you know, in my, on my watch, so to speak? So there are different kinds. There's a lot of different kinds of laws, a little, you know, with, with different nuances and different details. So it goes, you know, through a whole, whole bunch of stuff. Also within this Torah reading as part of the list of laws is that we have the first mention and the <coughs> I'm going to 
<coughs> go back, I'm sorry. Um, uh, I'm gonna go back to um, um, the Torah reading itself. And um, we have the first mention of the sabbatical year system. So uh, this year is a sabbatical year and uh, we can find on page 472 in Exodus chapter 23, verse 10, um, gives us the beginning discussion, the first discussion of a number of discussions in the Torah. We have a discussion here, we have a discussion in Leviticus again, and then in Bihar, and then we have another, and then it continues uh, references into the next Torah reading, and then we have another uh, discussion uh, with additional material that's in uh, Devarim. So we have it uh, in, in Deuteronomy uh, also in, in Re'eh. So the, the sabbatical concept is very important. And this is the first time we encounter it. Who's going to read for us th uh, today? Somebody going to read for us? Probably. Thank you, Natalie. Do you have the Torah reading in front of yes, you also? So, I do. So do you want so, the Torah or the half Torah? So right now, first, we'll start just with this little section, the half Torah, which begins um, on uh, the, the Torah. I'm sorry, the Torah reading, 472, uh, uh, pay, uh, verse 10. 10, verse 10. 11, 12. Okay, 10. Six years you shall sow your land and gather in its yield. <clears throat> but in the seventh, you shall let it rest and lie fallow. Let the needy among your people eat of it, and what they leave, let the wild beasts eat. You shall do the same with your vineyards and with your olive groves. Six days you shall do your work, but on the seventh day you shall cease from labor in order that your ox and your ass may rest, and that your bondsman and the stranger may be refreshed. Okay, so this is... Uh, a combination of, of two concepts. The end of it is another discussion of the classic concept of Shabbat, right? That, uh, that six days shall you work and then on the seventh day you should rest and everybody should benefit from this. But the previous verses say that we're, and we heard about Shabbat already a couple of times, but now the previous verses say, this Shabbat idea doesn't just apply every week, it applies through a yearly cycle, six years of working and then a seventh year of uh, resting, right? And what in, the, in that uh, um, short little uh, the, uh, uh, set of verses, it says that who's gonna benefit from this? What does it say there in verse 11? The needy. The needy. Right, Evyon Cha. This is going to be a boon to those people in society who are not well off. So the Torah and it, and we, you know, we haven't looked at a whole bunch of other things. The Torah has a recognition again and again and again that this society that the Jewish people are building is not going to be a perfect society. It's not going to be this, you know, Shangri-La. There's going to be haves and have-nots. There's going to be the way we say today, income inequality. And it's a fact of life. The question is then, how do we help the poor? The Torah accepts the idea that they're going to be poor people as a reality, but the Torah doesn't say, well, so that's the way things are. You know, you know, uh, the winners win and the losers lose. And some religious traditions do see it that way. That's, you know, if God likes you, you'll succeed in life. If God doesn't like you, you won't succeed in life. Our constant refrain throughout the Torah, and it happens more than once in the Torah reading uh, uh, of Mishpatim and throughout the, the Torah is that we have to extend a hand to the poor. We have to help the poor. We have to try to uh, uh, make life easier for them. We have to make it possible for them to try to not be poor. So here is this, uh, social uh, economic engineering where the Torah says every seven years we're doing something 
to help the poor as a as a as a mass effort. Now, just one more thing from the Torah reading before we get to the Haftarah. Now let's go back all the way to the beginning of the Torah reading to 457. Okay, 457, and this is Exodus chapter 21, verse two. Got it, Natalie? You're on it. You're the designated reader tonight. You have to go off mute. You have to unmute yourself. When you acquire a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years. In the seventh year, he shall go free without payment. Okay, so without going through all of the ins and outs and so on, we do notice again that theme of the magic number seven. Okay, so we have sevens in our Torah reading in Shabbat, which applies to every person in the society every week. Then we've got the idea that on a national level, there's this kind of cycle of years, six years of working, and then a Shabbat year, a full year of economic rebooting, so to speak. And now we have another idea that people may be sold into slavery, and this you're just gonna have to accept the summary that I'm giving you. This is a situation where a person is um, either poor or has committed um, a crime, and that crime could be because of his poverty, and he can't pay the, uh, uh, the debts that he has incurred. Either he's incurred debts because he's a poor person and he borrowed money and then he can't pay it back, or maybe he damaged something, uh, he broke into a store and he can't pay it back because he's too poor. So how does he end up restoring uh, the, the, uh, the damage that he is responsible for? He has to work it off. You know, like the person who can't pay the, the restaurant bill, he goes into the back of the restaurant and he washes the dishes. So that's, that's the, the kind of indentured servitude is the way we call it, uh, that, that uh, he uh, may land up in. So again, we have the concept of the poor person as part of society, and this person needs to pay off. They have a responsibility. If they owe money, it's not, it's not uh, you know, just said, ah, so what? Rather, they have to find, we have to find a way for them to be able to pay it off. But the paying off is done again, says the Torah, within a limited amount of time. Six years do you, you work, the seventh year you go without payment, that's it. The, the, the person who uh, is the master, so to speak, who maybe is the person who's, who you owed the money to, can't claim, oh, what do you mean? But, but you, know, you, you, uh, you, know, you still owe me you know, $10,000, too bad. Six years you work, and then on the seventh year, you go free. Okay, so these are things that we need to remember um, so that when we get into the Haftarah and I ask my famous Jeopardy question, what does this Haftarah do with our, have to do with our, with our Torah reading? Um, you may have some, some information to go on. Okay, so now, wait a second, I got have to find the page again because I'm, going all over the place. Now we're going to turn to the Haftarah. So the Haftarah, as I said, is on page 482. The prophet is Jeremiah, chapter 34, starting with verse 8. Before the, the verse 8, the previous verses give us the setup for this. Jeremiah is giving this um, prophecy um, after he has told off the king, Sidkiyahu, Zedekiah, who is the king of Judah around the year 489 BCE, that he should stop trying to fight Babylonia and he should try to make peace with Babylonia because he has no hope of defeating the Babylonians. Um, and guess what? They don't listen to him. And uh, now there's a siege on Jerusalem. The siege on Jerusalem started um, on the 10th of Tevet, and eventually Jerusalem will be captured, the first temple will be destroyed, 586 approximately, 
So now we're right before that. We're right before the temple is, is going to be destroyed. And the siege um, has, uh, um, has been enforced, reinforced by the Babylonians. So Judah is, is, is under, is in war, is at war with Babylonia. Babylonia is, you know, a zillion times more powerful than they are. They thought they had, we actually talked a little bit about this one other time. Remember that they thought Egypt was going to help them out and Egypt then, uh, you know, didn't do that. So here, what we have also is that for a while, Babylonia was preoccupied with Egypt and the siege loosened up. But then once they disposed of, of the Egyptians, um, they came back with full force and, this, and the siege of Jerusalem is back in force. So that's the background. And now Jeremiah is going to proclaim another Jeremiah, another angry um, uh, you know, you know, tirade against um, the powers that be who, are, who refuse to, uh, uh, to listen uh, to God's word. Okay, so here we are uh, ready to begin. Natalie, it's all yours. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord after King Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people in Jerusalem to proclaim a release among them, that everyone should set free his Hebrew slaves, both male and female, and that no one should keep his fellow Judean enslaved. Everyone, officials and people who had entered into the covenant agreed to set their male and female slaves free and not keep them enslaved any longer. They complied and let them go. But afterward, they turned about and brought back the men and women they had set free and forced them into slavery again. And it was that the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Right then it was, right then. So that's now the next part of setup. Is there any connection with our Torah reading? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I guess so. Sarita thinks it's a pretty obvious Absolutely, question, right? Yeah. Right. This would not be on a, like a final exam. It does, this right. wouldn't this wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't rate as a good question. Um, so but but let's let's uh, you know look at this a little bit more closely. So <clears throat> What we have is a report that King Tzidkiyahu, um, who Jeremiah had uh, had warned him, don't get stop stop messing with Babylonia. Don't get into this. You have no hope. You're going to be exiled. He says to him. He says to him. You know, you're going to be taken. You know, uh, uh, captive if you keep going like this. Um, and now we find out that. There was a covenant, a Brit, right? Um, that was established in the Hebrew, verse 10, right? Asher Ba'uba Brit. They all had entered into a covenant to set free, each person setting free their slaves, right? Whether male or female, to set them free and not work with them. And they all agree to abide by this covenant. Okay, so that sounds great, right? Um, but let's think a little more, uh, you know, critically about this. What does it mean that they had to create a covenant to do this? My well, question- People is, weren't doing it. I mean, this was exactly. supposed to be being they, done without. Right but right. people weren't, and so they had to be reminded, right. hey, so, you're supposed to be doing so, this. So that's what's underneath this, right? What's underneath this is if you have the Torah reading, the Torah reading says that freeing the slaves happens automatically. Everybody gives, has to free their slaves without complaining, without you know asking for more money or damages or anything. The slave works for you and then goes free. And here we have a national reform movement, right? which says, you know what, this is not happening. We're gonna to have to have the federal government intervene and make sure that everybody frees their slaves. And at least in this first you know, part of our report, everybody goes along with it. Yeah, Jen. Um, so either Hashem's or Zedekiah's credit, it's a more expansive, right? Because now it's freeing women as well, which it didn't before. No, it did before. The women got freed also in a, in a similar kind of situation. 
So we're not going to go into all the details, but yes, it applied to the women as well. Um, okay. So, but it is more expansive in 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 a certain way, right? It's not keyed to whether the the slaves have worked their full six years. Yeah. So some of them may have been working twenty years and have been abused and not been freed, but some of them may have just started to be slaves six months ago, and they and they're going to be freed, right? So. In that sense, also, it's not really abiding by the Torah's mandate. This is a full-blown amnesty, so to speak, right? For all is, it of meant, is it meant to be like eternal abolition for you can't have Jewish slaves anymore? Well, it, that, that, that we, we never would be able to find out because just, you know, we find out, you know, what happened, you know, to this amnesty in the next verse. So. Um, what some people, uh, and I and I think a couple other people had some comments, so raise your hand again after I say the, the next thing. Um, what some people, a lot of people say is that this was actually part of the war effort, that they needed more people to go and fight. So this was a way to uh, increase the ranks of the army by freeing all of these slaves so it wasn't simply that all of a sudden everybody got religion, but um, it was also, in a certain sense, a kind of a, uh, you know, you know, it, it was to their advantage to, you know, we got to fight these Babylonians, and uh, we need as much, you know, uh, as as much help as we can. Um, why that would mean that the women also got freed? Going back to Jen's point is not that clear, but this is the way a lot of people are reading the historical situation. Um, yeah, Audrey, you wanted to say something. Um, this is rem this reminds me here where it says that they freed them and then forced them back into slavery. That's that where we is, come back to the next thing, right. With Egypt, is that the- Not like, Egypt, it, not Egypt. But it does remind me of that. It reminds, right, right. When, when Pharaoh had second thoughts, all right, and said, oh no, what did I do? I let them all go. Yeah, very good. So, but this is, you know, and, and we've talked about this other times and this is part of the, of the sharp critique that's here. You can't blame this on any other bad guys. This is not Egypt. This is not Amalek. This is not any, you know, uh, the, the Canaanites. This is not, uh, you know, the Amorites. This is us doing it to ourselves. This is, we are guilty of these same kinds of uh, uh, reneging on, on our uh, promises of, of not being able to hold on to, to a, a righteous act. When we do it, we, we end up ruining it. So yeah, that's part of the force of this. This is a really bitter condemnation. Um, again, the historical background um, was, according to many people who read this, that I told you before that for a while, e um, Egypt was fighting Babylonia. Babylonia was preoccupied with them. So they eased up the, uh, um, the siege. So a lot of commentators say, that's when they took their slaves back. They go, ah, oh, now we don't need more army. Now we can, now let's get back to business as usual. Um, so uh, the famous uh, uh, parking joke, right? So, uh, which I will tell anyway, even though everybody knows it by heart. I don't know it. You, you know it, you know it. All so, right. um, so a person is, is uh, you know, late for an appointment, they're driving. Uh, oh, to... I know it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay, I'm telling it anyway. I'm don't telling you anyway. it. This is, we're all sharing something that we all enjoy. And, and uh, here it is. So the person is, the person is driving, trying to get to their appointment. They're running late. It's awful. They get to the building. And then the question is, they can't find a parking spot. They, 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 have, to, they have to park and they're, they're desperate and so much is riding on this meeting. So literally. Um, so uh, so they, they, they finally say, God, I'll, I'll, I'll do anything. I'll, I'll go to shul. I'll, I'll, do, I'll keep all the commandments just give me a parking spot. I need a parking spot, um, you know, desperately. This is life and death. Right at that moment, miraculously, somebody pulls out of their parking spot and voila, 
and the person at the at the at the at the you know sitting in the car goes, "Oh God, forget it. There's a parking spot that just opened up." Okay, <laughs> right. So, uh, so so that's so that's the you know the perspective. So that's what happened here. So the you know the 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 Jewish people, um, they get nervous, and then as soon as the pressure goes off a little bit, they're back to their old ways. And what we have here, let's read 11 one more time. Natalie, can you read us, read, read verse 11, please? You have to unmute, Natalie. Yep. But afterward, they turned about and brought back the men and women they had set free and forced them into slavery again. Okay, so what do we see here? <laughs> They force them into slavery again. So again, let's think about the Torah reading. The Torah reading presents, for all of its problems, the Torah reading presents the institution of slavery, for at least for a Hebrew slave, as something that goes according to the law. There's, there's a, a, a very controlled system <coughs> of right and wrong, and the law is supervising what's supposed to be happening and, and uh, um, therefore everything is mishpat, fair judgment. Now we see that this institution of slavery is not working that way. People are actually capturing their old slaves and putting them back into servitude, right? That's what the Torah, that's what the, the, the Haft Torah says, right? They turned around and brought back the men and the women that they had set free, right? So um, this is, uh, and if you look at the Hebrew, and this is something that's that's uh, going to uh, be important for later. I'm going to read the Hebrew, vayashuvu acharechein, vayashivu et ha'avadim v'et ha'shvachot asher shulchu chavshim, vayichbeshum la'avadim v'lishvachot, and they captured them or they forced them to be uh, uh, slaves again. But the word is vayashuvu, vayashivu. They returned again. They brought these people back. So we're gonna see what is it, when, when do we also have the word lashuv? Returning. Shuva, returning. Right, right. Shabbat shuva. Shabbat shuva. Come back, come back to God. So no, no. how do we return? Do we return to our old ways or do we return to our better selves? So here we have this ironic repetition and we're gonna see that it's also gonna happen some more in the, in, the, in the Haftarah again and again. It's like, you know, this is the same old, same old, right? Why can't people, uh, you know, abide by their own covenant? They made a covenant. They made a breed. I will uh, also point out this Torah reading for the Shabbat. At the end of the Torah reading, I didn't get around to actually to mentioning that. Talks about the breed that is uh, made between God and the people of Israel at Mount Sinai, because our Torah reading is part of a string of Torah readings that are still taking place at Mount Sinai at the giving of the Torah. So the word Brit, covenant, is one of the major, major concept words that we have in our tradition. And here, the people undertook a Brit, and then they desecrated it. And then they desecrated it. And this is where um, Jeremiah um, digs in. Okay, so now we're at verse 13. Thus said the Lord, the God of Israel, I made a covenant with your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, the house of bondage, saying, in the seventh year, each of you must let go any fellow Hebrew who may be sold to you. When he has served you six years, you must set him free. But your fathers would not obey me or give ear. Lately, you turned about and did what is proper in my sight, and each of you proclaimed a release to his countrymen, and you made a covenant accordingly before me in the house which bears my name. But now you have turned back 
and have profaned my name, each of you has brought back the men and women whom you had given their freedom and forced them to be your slaves again. So here we have a reiteration in the name of God. Not These are not just the facts, but God says, I see what you're doing. And God puts it into that uh, background of Breit. Remember, I made a Breit with you. I freed you from slavery. How can this institution be so appealing to you? How can this institution be something that you want to use in this power move against your own people? Right? And you, so he gives the details, which we already went through, right? And then he says, Your ancestors, your parents didn't listen to me. So now we find out that this evil, this social evil, has been going on for quite a while. Right, Jeremiah says in the name of God that I've been watching and you haven't been obeying what I said in the Torah for generations. You don't free your slaves in the seventh year. You're supposed to do it and you don't. And here we go again. Oh, by the way, lo shamu, they didn't listen, they didn't obey. At the very end of our Torah reading, the Israelites at Mount Sinai say everything that God commands, na'asevenishma, we will do and we will listen, we will obey. But we said it at Mount Sinai, we promised. And now we're guilty you know, of long-term disregard for all of the promises that we made. And then God says, what's worse is verse 15. Let's read that one more time. Lately, you turned about and did what is proper in my sight. And ah, that, wait, wait, okay. Batashuvu, here we go again. You turned around, you returned. You actually did <laughs> repentance. You actually made it better. You decided to abide by these rules. You decided to abide by what's righteous and what's correct. And, but 16. 16, where was 16? <laughs> Worried but now, me. but now you have turned back. And you have, have turned back again. Tashuva, tashuvu. There's this word again and again, right? This is you. You're flip flopping back and forth. You're completely unreliable. You can't be trusted. One one day you decide to turn around and do the right thing. The next day, no, I didn't mean it. It's not really the right thing. And of course, what did you do? You Batashivu, you brought back, you returned all of the men and women that you had enslaved and brought them back again. Um, I don't think that I have to belabor also the American history parallels of, of, of this, uh, this whole story that happened 150 years ago and that are happening today. We, we free the slaves, then we get Jim Crow. We, we give the... the, the uh, um, the, the uh, African-American uh, community, the right to vote. And then we make sure that it's impossible to exercise that right. So this is the zigzagging of a society that, that uh, um, some people are pushing in a certain way, but then there's a massive resistance and a massive pushback the other way. And on the backs of the poor, the needy, the unfortunate, uh, the powerless. Okay, so we continue verse 17. Assuredly, thus said the Lord, you would not obey me and proclaim a release <clears throat> each to his kinsmen and countrymen. Lo, I proclaim your release, declares the Lord, to the sword, to pestilence, and to famine. And I will make you a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth. I will make the men who violated my covenant <clears throat> who did not fulfill the terms of the covenant which they made before me, the calf which they cut in two so as to pass between the halves. Okay, so let's, let's stop for a second. <coughs> so now God says, oh yeah, measure for measure. Poetic justice. If this is the way you're gonna behave, then you're gonna get the same thing on your heads. The word that um, I wanna highlight here is the word 
that's translated here as release. In Hebrew, the word is drawer. And drawer is also fittingly translated as, anybody know? Marty can't hear you. Still can't hear you. You're on mute. As long as you're on mute, I can't hear you. Generation? No, that's door. Good. That's door. This is drawer. Drawer is liberty. This that's what I said. Is, right. I just couldn't hear you. You were on mute. So this is the word that we find later in Leviticus when, Levit when Leviticus talks about the sabbatical rules and then adds another layer to the sabbatical rules that says not only is it every seven years that you should have a sabbatical, but every seven sabbaticals, you should have a super sabbatical called the Jubilee year, right? And then the Torah says then, ukratem dror ba'aretz l'chol yoshveha, that you shall proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants thereof. That's the liberty bell. That's what we have in Philadelphia. That's, those are the words that that verse in the Torah is inscribed, is incised, etched into the bell in Philadelphia. This is the image that became an inspiration in American history of liberty, freedom. So you now here we go again. Here God says you were supposed to proclaim liberty. You were supposed to let go and free everybody to be able to be what they could be. Well, you know what? You didn't do that. I'm going to proclaim liberty too. I'm going to make you hefker. I'm going to make you just absolutely out there subject to anything and everyone that's in the world. And you will be a horror because you will not be able to defend yourselves. You'll just be... Every, it's, it's going to be a free-for-all. And believe me, there's more of the world than there is of you. You won't be able to defend yourselves. You won't be able to take care of yourselves. The whole time that you've been safe, it's because I have had expectations of you to follow these rules of righteousness. And you don't want to do it. Okay? You don't want to? Then I'm going to, I'm going to free you out into the currents of, of, uh, of uh, the world as it, as it uh, you know, as, as a doggy dog uh, situation, right? Um, okay, 18. 18 or 19, 18? Well, you did, you did 18, so, okay, good. Let's do, and there's the covenant again, the breed. Okay, good, 19. 18 is significant in terms of the... Okay, go ahead. Oh yeah, so there's more things in 18 for sure. Right. What, what's what's the covenant? How is the covenant described there? No, but it it, 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 it reminds us of of sacrifices where they cut the carcass and they walk between. And I don't remember right. the exact place, but it's the, called the Brit Bain Habitarim, the covenant of the pieces. This is one of the original covenants back with Abraham and God. It's a whole murky night vision, and God says to Abraham, "Take these animals." cut them in half, put them on, you know, an, a, with a pathway in between, and you and I are going to walk between these cut animals. That's going to confirm our covenant together. And historians have pointed out this is an ancient Near Eastern ceremony. This wasn't uh, invented by the Torah. It was used by the Torah as a, as a given, only here the, 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 uh, usually the covenants are between a king and a, and a, and a vassal state or, or a, you know, a, a master and a slave. Here, this is between God and Abraham. And that's where now God says, okay, so you know what? Um, you didn't, you didn't uh, um, abide by that covenant. Um, and uh, the cutting in half now takes on a kind of a scary um, uh, uh, meaning. Instead of being the ones who are making the covenant, you will be the slaughtered animals that people will make covenants with, uh, uh, you know, about. They're gonna use you like cattle, like, like animals. They'll slaughter you and they'll make Egypt and make a covenant with, with, uh, with Babylonia, with Persia, with this one, with that one. 
and you'll just be cannon fodder. You'll just be you'll just be the the uh, um, you know the material that they that they uh, uh, destroy. Okay, nineteen. The officers of Judah and Jerusalem, the officials, the priests, and all the people of the land who pass between the halves of the calf shall be handed over to their enemies, to those who seek to kill them. Their carcasses shall become food for the birds of the sky and the beasts of the earth. I will hand over King Zedekiah of Judah and his officers to their enemies who seek to kill them, to the army of the king of Babylon, which has withdrawn from you. I hereby give the command, declares the Lord, by which I will bring them back against this city. They shall attack it and capture it and burn it down. I will make the towns of Judah a desolation without inhabitant. Okay. So in uh, 19, all of you who have passed between the halves of the, of the, of the animals, did they actually do that? No, they didn't, they didn't actually really have that ceremony. But Abraham and God did. And we are the children of Abraham. So that covenant that was, that was established all the way back then, that is binding on all of us. And just like there were sacrifices that were offered on Mount Sinai, and Moses at the end of our Torah reading this Shabbat, Moses takes the blood from the sacrifices and sprinkles it on all of us to include us in that, in that cutting of, the, of a deal. We've cut a deal together with God. So that's what uh, God says now. You have in, in, engaged in that kind of cutting of a deal and you've, and you've betrayed it. So forget about it, right? You will all be, um, you will turn into the carcasses. Um, I wanna again, verse 22, I hereby give the command and go ahead, Natalie, one more time. I hereby give the command, declares the Lord, by which I will bring them back. That's all. I will bring them back. That's that same returning. That's the same verb, right? So you didn't do tshuva. You didn't return to me. Instead, you brought back your, um, your slaves. Well, then you know what? I'm going to bring back your oppressors. I'm going to bring back your enemies. If that's if you can't, you know, hold hold fast to that covenant of yours, then, and you renege, you turn back on it, then I will bring those uh, um, enemies back to you, and death and destruction, and captivity will follow. So that's the end of that uh, chapter. So. As a textual unit, that is the conclusion of this particular uh, um, prophecy by Jeremiah. The rabbis, though, have a little bit of a, uh, um, what can I say, a guiding principle. They can't leave things with that because that is so horrible and that is so um, distressing and it's so awful to, con to contemplate, they have an idea, and we do this in a number of different ways, that we never end on the, on the, on the evil, on the, on the, on the, the terrible, on, the, on the, uh, uh, the negative. We always have to end on something that is consoling, that's hopeful, that's inspiring, something good. We apply this principle all over the place. So for instance, when we read from the Torah, so we divide up the Torah reading on Shabbat into seven different sections. And sometimes we're reading a, a part of the Torah where we've got some very horrible stuff. And it could be some, you know, somebody does a, a terrible sin, somebody says something that's awful against God or something like that. And the rabbis, made a decision programmatically. We will never end a Torah reading, an aliyah, with a negative verse. So they, they make, you know, sometimes the Torah reading therefore will have to go on. If there's a lot of negative verses, one after another, it's gonna be a long aliyah until we can finally get, a, you know, a, a, a positive, hopeful 
good, the word good, if we can find the word good, we'll end with that, right? So, so, um, so that's how the, that's how the, the policy was applied. Um, we know, of course, that when we pray, we always pray at the end of our prayers with a prayer for peace. That's the way that the Amida ends. That's the way that the Kaddish ends and so on. So benching. So here the rabbis wanted to ameliorate, wanted to soften this terrible, terrible um, message of Yirmiyahu. So what they did was, this is what I said earlier, they did something very unusual. Instead of going forward and finding something good, they went backwards. They went to the previous chapter and they found the last couple of verses from the previous chapter, which was a separate prophecy, but which they ended up using uh, over here. So we turn the page to 484. And here- Thus saith it, the Lord, as surely as I have established my covenant with day and night, the laws of heaven and earth, so I will never reject the offspring of Jacob and my servants, David. I will never fail to take from his offspring rulers for the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Indeed, I will restore their fortunes and take them back in love. Okay, so here we have in this short little uh, text, these two verses, we have repeats of some of the thematic words that we had in the Haftorah, the bulk of the Haftorah. What kind of words are being repeated here? Which words do we have here as echoes of the themes that we just dealt with? Riti. Riti, my covenant. Here we have another discussion of covenant, but this is a different covenant. What are the covenants that we had in the Haftorah until now? What covenants have we mentioned, have we had that we mentioned? The covenant to uh, release the slaves. A covenant among the Jewish people among themselves to release the slaves. And a covenant what, with uh, Abraham. A covenant with Abraham to establish the relationship between God and Abraham, the progenitor of the Jewish people. Another covenant about slaves, the covenant at Mount Sinai. Right. right? We had a covenant with the entire people. And in that covenant was the concern for how to limit and control the idea of slavery and to make sure that every slave goes free, just like you did, right? So we have all of these national, historical, uh, social covenants. What's the covenant that we have here in this verse, uh, verse 25? This is, the, um, the, is this the covenant about um, sort of not destroying the earth and about having the earth continue and, you know, day into night, night, you know? Right, right. There's, and that, well, that's kind of a, I would say that's a, even a renewal of the covenant, but it's, it's a kind of a, the creation itself is seen as a covenant. I made a covenant with night and day, that night and day should, should just continue to, to exist. And hold on a second, I'm getting one of these technical things telling me about that I'm going to, I'm supposed to update something or other. And I'm not. <laughs> but they're not letting me do this. So now I'm going to try it again. There I am back. Um, so what God says here is that I have an eternal covenant with night and day. And it was renewed, like Sarita says, it was renewed after the flood. And Noah and his, uh, uh, you know, following the progeny were promised, I'm not going to do this again, right? This is going to be forever, right? Um, that's a faithful covenant. Guess what? Night and day have never disobeyed God. Right? Night and day have always abided by their covenant, by their by their side of the of the of the agreement. So now. What God says is, you may be unfaithful, you may be unreliable, but I am eternally faithful to this covenant that I made not only with heaven and earth, but with you day and night. I made it with you. So I will never reject the offspring of Jacob and my servant David. 
no matter how bad things get, I may get very angry, I may chastise you, but the covenant will never break. The covenant will always be preserved. So that's the extra uh, you know, uh, um, focus on, on uh, the covenant. And then what do we have at the end? The last, the last phrases, what? Shavutim. Right, we have that same verb again, that same noun of returning, of bringing back, of restoring. God says, ki ashiv et shvutam. I will return, I will bring back, I will restore. Their, here it says their fortunes, but the word shvutam could also mean their, cap, their captives. It could mean their own need to be restored, to be brought back to, uh, to health. Right? And then, bericham tim. And I will love them. I will have compassionate love for them. So this is all part of God's promise, but it always leaves, you know, in, in, in you know, hanging in the air. How good are we with our promises? Right? And, and, and uh, how, how much can we um, ask God to, to, uh, to count on us? And with that, the Haftorah concludes. Um, any, any other uh, comments, remarks? Yeah, Marty. No, you're on mute. You really said something very important there, I'm sure. But it's on <laughs> mute. If, uh, you know, God or Hashem will always love us and we have this covenant, how do you explain the really awful things that have happened time after time after time to our people? So the traditional answer is, we say it on Yom Tov uh, uh, Musaf, um, it's in Eicha also, Eicha, which is traditionally uh, attributed to Jeremiah, to our prophet of this Haftorah, who says we, you know, Jerusalem, he lives to see his prophecies tragically come true. And, uh, and he sees Jerusalem destroyed and he sees the horrible, horrible suffering of the Jewish people. And he says, because we, we abandoned you, we abandoned you. And these words of warning, this is part of this traditional approach. It, it could have been different. We could have stopped this tragedy from happening. We, we could have uh, um, you know, been able to uh, uh, restore, back to that, that same word again, our relationship with God, and then God would have protected us and God would have engineered things to be different. That's I'm one, right, right. wait, 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 that's one traditional answer. Um, it's not an answer that um, most, um, certainly uh, non-traditional Jews, but even in the, in the Orthodox community, there's plenty of people, at least secretly, because um, you're not allowed to actually say it uh, out loud in the Orthodox community, but there are plenty of people today uh, who just don't buy that and, and uh, who can't accept that. And certainly the levels of suffering that the Jewish people have, have undergone um, you know, bring that kind of uh, 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 answer you know, into, into real deep, you know, questionability. So that's, that's one thing. I'm going to add one more thing and then, you, and then you can talk. Part of the other answer is that once God gives us the freedom, that drawer that I mentioned before, the liberty as human beings to act in this world as we wish, then we got a kind of a biblical prelude for history, which teaches us how much God cares about us, but then we're supposed to learn from that. That's what God says here also. We're supposed to learn from that. Guess what? You know, God doesn't do uh, you know, uh, uh, the exodus from Egypt every, every uh, six months. God does the exodus from Egypt once, and then we're supposed to take that to heart. God gives us the Torah once, and we're supposed to learn the lessons from that. If we treat each other as animals, 
we meaning the human, you know, human beings, if we constantly destroy each other, kill each other, enslave each other, spit on each other, all those kinds of things that human beings seem to love to do to each other, if we do that, all God can do is cry. And that's, you know, that's part of our tradition also, that, that the days where God ran everything are done. God taught us when we were little tiny toddlers, God taught us to learn right from wrong. But then we grow up, we grow up and then it's on us, it's not on God. So that's another partial answer. None of these answers are great, um, but that's another answer. What do you want to say? Robert, what about Jeremiah's comment to the effect that you shall work to support the welfare of the nation to which I have exiled you, for in its welfare ye shall find your welfare. What about being in these, some of these terrible, awful places that our people have been in, and the, the welfare of those nations have not, you know, rebounded to our welfare? Well, sometimes it's not, it's not, that's not, that's sometimes and sometimes not. The Jewish people, there was a great, great, great uh, modern Jewish historian. His name was Salo Baron, right? You, you've heard his name. He was a great professor. He was in Columbia. He wrote, a, you know, a, a multi-volume, you know, something like 20 volume Jewish history. He got up to 1650. You know, he, he uh, so he, you know, it's like he, he was an amazing historian. And he said something uh, uh, that he's known for saying a number of times, we should get over this, the, the approach of, of a lacrimose approach to Jewish history. So- Arthur the, Herzberg it, used to say that, another Columbia historian. Well, he was a student of, he was a student yes. of Baron. So the lacrimose, lacrimose is crying. So what Salo Baron said was that we shouldn't just cry, duh, Jewish history, it's they, they killed us here and then they did a program here and then they exiled us here and then they expelled us here. And he said, you know what? I know a little bit of history. And that's such a partial picture of Jewish history. There are golden ages all over the place. There are places and times in Jewish history where we had a great uh, um, you know, uh, period of, of engagement with the, with the local uh, civilization and the local authorities and so on. That's what Jeremiah is talking about. What Jeremiah is talking about is learn how, when you can, learn how to get along in the society that you're in, because we all benefit from that. Now we're Perfect. in a very, we're in a very, very tricky, awful, um, psychologically for sure, and sometimes physically as well, uh, difficult time as Jews in the United States, because we've had a great run in the United States. And we've had, you know, the most glorious success as a people, as a, as a minority community in, in a host society than practically anywhere at any time. And now we're getting shaken up, rightfully so, um, by the, you know, the rise of anti-Semitic incidents and, and you know, thank God uh, for, for the safety that everybody uh, uh, emerged uh, you know, from in, in, in uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago in, in Texas, but it could have been terribly different. So we're struggling with this now. We're struggling with, you know, how do we evaluate our environment? And when that quote from Jeremiah that you're talking about, Jeremiah is saying is just watch, watch where and what uh, and when you're doing what you wanna do. Um, because recognize that your options are limited and you are living under a lot of contingency. So we need wisdom, we need uh, patience, we need, uh, we need to deal with our fear um, with, with devotion to the right thing and with courage. All right, it's late, it's time to finish for today. So um, I'm sure that these things will come up, you know, shuv again and again. Take care. So I, right. it, wait, I gotta you. do the the whatchamacallit. Thank you. I gotta do Thank the, you. Thank you.